Do you think Hollywood has the best interests of Black people in mind when they make films? Decisions are made in rooms, in offices, at the highest level that are very conscious. It's not happenstance that a mammy ends up on the screen. Welcome to Push Black's Black History Year. I'm Jay, and thanks for giving us some time today. When we were putting together ideas for the podcast, we knew we wanted to dig into the ways Black folks are represented in media. We wanted to know, why are we portrayed in certain ways? Whose interest does it serve? And how can we take back control of our images? I'm sure everyone has a lot to say about this one. So when we were looking for an amazing expert, Morehouse's Dr. Stephanie Dunn was at the top of our list. Dr. Dunn is one of the founding members of Morehouse's Cinema, Television, and Emerging Media Studies program, and she serves as its program director. So, in the context of film and other popular media, what does Black liberation look like to you? Wow, that's such a great question. Well, I think that film, just like the autobiography, I think, served as a literary genre for one of the platforms for us to articulate a vision of ourselves, which was radical and revolutionary because it pushed against the mainstream representations of us as merely servants, as step and fetchets, as mammies, et cetera, et cetera. So it's one of the modern technological artistic spaces, right, for us to claim as well to offer counter narratives, first about who we are and who we were not and the complexities that make of us, but also as a call to arms. For example, pushing back, as Oscar Michaud did with Within Our Gates, against Birth of a Nation, which is, you know, the first sort of, when you think about it, modern film in one way, but absolutely still one of the most racist films ever to be made, ever, anywhere, right? So cinema was a space that we entered into fully conscious of its power to articulate, right, who we were or to represent where who we are and who we are not. But at the same time, it certainly was also entertainment, joy, um, you know, as well as this weapon or tool, if you will, for our liberation. So I think when you think about films like Sweetback's Badass Song, which Huey Newton called the first revolutionary film, now other folks debated that. But the point is that it did come out of the Black political movements of the 1960s and the early 70s. That film, hard to imagine it coming to be if it were not for the Black Power movement, the Civil Rights Movement, the demand to see that represented on the screen, but also to see Black voices articulating what revolution and liberation looks like on the screen. I'd like for our audience to have an understanding of how our images have changed over time. So can you give me an overview of how Black folks have been depicted in film over time. Sure, absolutely. So we start with motion picture in the early 1900s, really, when motion picture was really beginning to develop and all signs were there that it was going to be the most powerful entertainment medium surpassing stage to a certain degree. So we see a lot in those early films two things. One, African people and literally people of African descent being presented as primitives because those Tarzan films, by the way, which came out of the books, began to be made into movies very early on, by 1919 or so. So we would see supposedly primitive Africans, right, seen through the prism of white folks coming to so-calledly Africa, right, and then conquering them. So there's one. So by the time we get to the 30s and 40s and we have sort of dominant genres where you'll see Black folk represented in film, where they are safely contained in comedy and in music, so to speak. Lots of times even performing in front of sort of like a white cotton club sort of audience even within the film. So the talents of Black folk are sort of confirmed. You've got the Shirley Temple films, right, which become vastly popular, sort of a war elixir in terms of entertainment with the great Will Robinson dancing alongside his little white co-star. You know, this grown male is a sidekick of this little white girl, right? So then we have sort of an emergent, creeping sense of the civil rights movement, right? And the sort of uh, cultural hot uh, heat that is going to be fully probably realized by the time we get to 1960, because we'll have in there the death of Emmett Till, and we'll have films that are the kind of the liberal films that are directed 
like member of the wedding and you've got, you know, uh, films like The Defiant One, Sidney Poitier. And we see the rise of Sidney Poitier as the preeminent Black star who is playing middle class characters a lot of times. He's so undeniably perfect. Well, who in their right mind, Black or white, rich or poor, would, you know, deny, you know, this Sidney Poitier character of, you know, guess who's coming to dinner fame. He's got like 60 million degrees and he's, you know, he's cultured and he's, and you're going to yourself like, well, what does the, what does the white girl in there have to offer him? But that's not the way it's played. So in the 60s, you see that, but you also see Black America going, these images are out of date, right? And we are not necessarily after, quote, integration. We are, you know, radically demanding something more than integration to be on the screen represented as so perfect that, you know, white folks approve of us. But by the time we get to 73 and 71, we've got Melvin Van People Sr., who is now capitalizing on this black power, you know, right, Black Panther sort of icon of badasses who are like no to the status quo. Oh, we coming to blow stuff up lest we get our rights. And so you get a whole bevy of Black directors and writers, um, storytellers with ideals because we are responsible for some of the iconic characters that come to life. You know, even, even you know, films like in Superfly, directed by Gordon Parks, you know, uh, senior, the, the great photographer's son, right? And we have Shaft, directed by Gordon Parks, right? And, and we have the spook that's set by the door, who's set by the door, one of my all-time favorite films based on a book by a Black man, Sam Greenlee, directed then and somewhat controlled that film by Black folk that was so hot it only stayed in the theater a few weeks. But it showed total arm Black Armageddon. So you get these films, and at the same time, you've got films still directed, you know, sort of mainstream liberal films, in a sense, like Sounder, Claudine, I mean, just think those were in the same three, like, years, 73, 74, and each were nominated for an Academy Award. It's, it's films that people don't even remember, along with the films people tend to focus on the most that were coined black exploitation, which really sort of embodied both the problem and the promise of radicalized films. And then that kind of sets the, the, the you know, the stage for Spike Lee to then emerge in the 80s and then, you know, by the 90s, the Hughes brothers and Men's to Society, and we have kind of a genre, Black male-oriented, another cycle of urban set films largely, you know, as they were, focused on sort of a Black male coming of age in the ghetto, trying to survive narrative, and then come to kind of an explosion of some urban romances, that genre, right, of the Love Jones and, and the like and so forth before we get to Tyler Perry, really, in the new millennium. Spook Who Said By The Door is also one of my all-time favorite ones. I recommend it to every new uh, person we bring on the team at Push Black. I'm like, yeah, you got to watch this before you even get started. So I want to dig a little deeper into the why. So we have these characters, these stereotypes, these tropes that exist, but it's not a coincidence they exist, right? Give me some insight on why you think the industry promotes certain images like the step and fetch or the Jezebel, all that stuff. Why do you think that these images are shown in repetition from when they were created, even up till now? Well, first, we got to understand that these images were never separated from the political and economic importance of maintaining them, right? Slavery had to be justified. It was justified largely through imagery, imagery of happy slaves, of the mammy, etc., now, that translated in, in, in film, which was not owned, operated at all by Black folk. So it represented the Jim Crow segregationist mentality of the time by showing Blacks constantly really as second-class citizens. So that maintained, that helped to maintain the status quo, if you will. So they're not se separated from the political implications of the racial segregation and also the racial brutality and so forth, and second-class citizenship that was being afforded to Black folk. Now, by the time you get to the 50s, 60s, and 70s, we are in this, you know, radical movement towards really a transformative status quo, never realized, mind you, but we come to a very violent decade and period by the time we're, we're you know, out of the 60s. Now, Hollywood is both a 
reflection, I like to say, you know, of who we are culturally. So if we are, in terms of women, still trying to fight for the equality of women, women are still not uh, represented very well in terms of executive leadership at studios and so forth, it's going to reflect in the films that get made. So we think now that because sometimes by the time we get to, you know, having a Spike Lee and others, that because we see more films sometimes that seem to indicate, hey, we're in a renaissance. We did that in the 70s. They said, renaissance. Look at all these films starting, you know, Black folk. But see, we forget the economics of Hollywood. Not all of these were Black independent films. And some of these were Hollywood studio films, the Shafts, the Cleopatras. Well, what happened when Hollywood lost interest? It no no longer needed it, right, to sort of help with the economic decline that Hollywood had actually found itself in. Those films, cheaply made, helped to bolster by tapping into this, this Black audience that Hollywood periodically goes, oh my goodness, yes, there are Black moviegoers. And they pay money, yes, to go. And we have since segregation, right? Walk, watching it up in balconies and segregated, you know, poor theaters and so forth. So by the time we get to a contemporary moment, even like we're in now, we're still, if you notice, having circular conversations. You know, Oscar's so white. Hello, check the box, right? You didn't think we were having that in the early 70s, the 60s? Hello, we were, okay? Um, we were still having the same conversation, not only about that, but also about Black control over the narrative. Who gets to call the shots behind the scenes? And we're having conversations about the same thing when films are successful. There's a big surprise. Why are there articles about the film making money? As if Black films don't make money when that's been proven time and time again. Whether you're talking about a best man that makes a lot of money, right? Or something like that. Or you're talking about a Black Panther. But you see, we continue to have to push back on a couple of myths. One is that we don't make money overseas when really Hollywood studios haven't invested or believed in that. Not that it's necessarily the truth. Do you see what I'm saying? And so we have a Black Panther and it's like, why are people, why are you surprised? Wow, this movie made a lot of money. But we can point to countless films, so-called Black-oriented films, can we not, that have done that, including Sweetback. That's why they started to invest into kind of rip-off films is because this film, which was in money, was independently raised, you know, among, you know, some some black colleagues. That's what he did, Melvin Van Peebles Sr. And then he made all that money after being rated X by an all-white jury. So I say that to say that now we see people like Tyler Perry, who under Tyler Perry, as a businessman, did understand something very fundamental, right? Which is that you can make movies, but you're going to basically be at the mercy still of Hollywood's elitism and Hollywood's sort of steal money, studio control sort of center unless, heck, you build one your own self, right? Great point. We're going to get into Tyler Perry for sure towards the end, so I'm glad you brought that up. To take it back to the question of why, would it be fair to say that there is an element of propaganda that exists in these films? Absolutely, as they have from the beginning. I mean, that's what Birth of a Nation was, right? And then most of the films that, you know, um, sort of put us in the box of music and comedy, right? They were propaganda in a sense as well in that they reinforced the ideal that this is our space. This is where we belong. This is, you know, the second-class citizenship and not as tycoons on Wall Street and so forth. This is not, where we, it didn't do, a fi- do films on Black Wall Street. You see what I mean? It's not, that was not, what the focus was because that didn't match the Jim Crow and, you know, racial hierarchy that was very well established. So the films reflected that. So, got a question about blackface, all right? Can you, for our audience, can you speak on what that is and any ways you see that relating to what's created today. I have some ideas, but I'm interested in your thoughts on that. Sure. Of course, blackface comes from its original menstrual um, tradition that was around before the advent of film and television and, and, and stage entertainment. And it's been called, you know, America's first, quote, quote popular entertainment. And that you had supposedly, you know, a white man who blackened his face, right? Who was supposedly imitating an old slave man in his walk and his dance. 
And he put that on and turned it into basically his comic entertainment routine in front of white audiences. And then, of course, that form of entertainment caught on and you had many white men, you know, uh, forming their entertainment groups as minstrel groups, if you will. And they went around the country in places where people had never even really seen black folk, period. And then you had black entertainers, talented entertainers like the great Bert Williams, who also had to participate in supposedly the parody of black identity and also blackening their faces and participating in this tradition of blackface. Now, it translated to film. So in The Jazz Singer by Al Jolson, it's probably the first famous representation of it, although you see this in cartoons, and you can even see Bugs Bunny in a blackface in a cartoon. Oh, yes, absolutely. Got to go in that vault. But in The Jazz Singer, right, we have Al Jolson singing about his dear old mammy in blackface. So it translated to screen. And of course, we see even now that we we see Americans who we think it's 2020, it's 2019, it's 20 anything, 2000 anything. How could you think it's correct? I don't think it's shocking that it ends up still, you know, being a conversation that we keep having because that's so insidiously implanted in American culture's representation of an ideology of blackness. So I have this uh, idea that I want to run by. You see what you think about this. You have people like Norman Lear who create, right, the Jeffersons, Sanford and Son, Different Strokes, all that stuff. The iconic shows that black folks to this day, like, love. However, creator was white. The writing room was white. They're presenting their idea of what blackness is, how black people are to masses of people. Um, and we often bought into that and white folks often bought into that. And I actually see that as uh, a form of blackface. And I, I think that the way that it's still set up today, like if there's not black folks telling the story, I think that's still a form of blackface just in a more subtle way since we don't really see that person on stage, but we see them presenting this image still of what they think blackness is. What are your thoughts on that? Those television shows that you mentioned by Norman Lear, who, I've, who I incidentally spent a whole evening with and had at Morehouse, and we had private conversations about um, that. Um, and so we spent a whole evening talking about and had the Jefferson stars and some of the facts of life. Kim Fields got her, you know, start there, there with us that evening. You know, at the time, of course, there was controversy with Black folk on the show, right, as you know. And other folks like Eric Monty, who you, whom you know had helped to create the Jeffersons. There was first All in the Family and so forth, obviously. and then you. Had the show Maud, Esther Roll was on Maud. And then they came to her with the show idea about the good, good times. And she was like, she was supposed to be a single mother, right? With these children in the Chicago ghetto. And she was like, basically, hell no. Where's her husband? I'm not doing that show. And so, hence James Evans. So even right there, you see, and I guess she had enough pull in the sense that they wanted her, you know, Esther Roll to play Florida. Evans. But she was like, I'm not, you know, mm -mm, mm -hmm. doing that. But the fact is that they had, that's the idea that mm. they had that was sellable, right? Is this is going to be this black mother sort of, you know, hey, unable to take care of her children without, not a nuclear family, mm. in other words. And then when we have the, you know, the, by the time we have the Jeffersons, you can clearly see in, in some of the writing that it was a liberal white sort of mentality, not necessarily all the time a black one. Because then that would have required there to be the diverse black voices behind the scenes that had sort of equal power, so to speak, in terms of the writing and just shaping the direction. That's why there was a great push and pull between the J.J. character, John Amos, the James Evans character, and Esther Roll, who began to be very you know, uncomfortable about what they saw as sort of the buffoonery, what they saw as sort of the buffoonery, from smart comedy to sort of a, a more of this you know, kind of zip coonish type stuff, they were uncomfortable with that. They felt like they had, and Norman Lear said this to me, he said that they had a difficult situation and that they were in tune with the desire of Black audiences not to see themselves misrepresented. He felt that responsibility. And so he fought, you know, when he didn't think that it represented the dignity 
so to speak, of Black folk. It was, you know, coming off at the rails on terms of that. And so that's why, you know, you see those characters and that conflict come out in whether you're watching All in the Family or, you know, later on the Jeffersons with George Jefferson. But certainly there was that great push and pull because, again, no, you know, Black folks starred in the shows. They were not the controllers of the creative vision, right, and the story and often the writer's room. Right. They were the black faces. Well, that's what you <laughs> that's what you um said. I'm not gonna I'm, put I'm that on you. I'm not gonna put that on you. I I think that I can see your your definitely your argument for calling it that. <laughs> so Tyler Perry mentioned him. He recently opened his studio. He's found success primarily through black audiences. And he works outside the system to a larger degree than most black directors or producers in the uh in Hollywood. And he probably hires more black actors than anybody. But he's been criticized through his entire career probably more than anybody as well. So what, in your opinion, are some of the main critiques you know of regarding Tyler Perry's films and how valid do you think they are? Well, I have uh, myself two published chapters and two books on Tyler Perry. And I think the first one was one of the first ones of academic treatment on Tyler Perry's films. So I've, you know, dealt with it in my writing as well. But of course, there's the central argument about representations that they contribute really to stereotypes of black folk um, and sort of cross the line of, you know, comedy into stereotypical comedy. So that's probably the first primary one, right, is that films traffic in stereotypes, the Medeas and so forth. And, you know, these are parodies that do not represent us any more than some of the traditional f- films that, you know, by white folks. So that's been one of the central arguments, right, early on and throughout the years uh, sporadically. And that's been pushed up against people who then argue back, you know, so you have those diehard Tyler Folk folks who were just then, you know, like, he's a great businessman, which I always say there's two different things going on and they don't need to be. We can celebrate and I think own what is this savvy entrepreneurial vision of Tyler Perry. That's legitimate. And he is going to be very much an important part of Black history and American history, American cinema history in terms of that. But we can also take issue and question and interrogate his trafficking in certain images of Black women, Black folk, of class Black identities. You know, people supposedly who are working class characters or quote ghetto characters we can interrogate that, I think. I think that that is absolutely justifiable to interrogate that. I don't think anybody makes so much money that they are above our interrogation if we strongly see that the representations on screen, when we've had and continue to have such a problematic history uh, of being misrepresented, you don't get a pass because you are Black. How important do you think he is in the history of Black film and filmmakers? Extraordinarily so. I mean, I think about Oscar Michaud, and he's probably the most well-known figure that we know from the early 20th century that we would point to as ahead of his time, but also sort of, to me, he anticipates a Tyler Perry because Oscar Michaud was absolutely a businessman and was trying to own his product. It was not just this artistic or political thing. He saw it as a business as well. And he was trying to exploit that as as well as he could. So Tyler Perry sort of, to me, is the realization of the Oscar, of Oscar Michaud's vision and effort in the early 20th century. So he is going to be very important. He's going to be in the history books. This is at a very important moment. This Black man built a studio and that he makes it in some ways for him and owed to some of the, the, the you know, the Black folk that he sees as important, like the city potier and stage, all of that is really important. But I also think that there is going to be obviously interrogation and measurement of his legacy, both of his representations of Black folk on the screen, but beyond that, as a writer and a filmmaker in terms of the quality of stories, the quality of his taking on the mantle always of director, writer, producer, because that's, I think those are all aspects that should be interrogated. Some of the measure of his legacy is also about what he does to push Black cinema narratives, opportunities for other artists forward, which I have not seen yet, quite frankly, with him. 
I see him investing in emerging artists who, quite fr- frankly, can just write their, you know, their behinds off, right? Yeah. Really well. They're not business folks, but they write better than him. They have studied film more as a craft and art, and they're invested in that. And I, that's the push I haven't seen that disappoints me. You mentioned the critique of representation of Black actors and sort of the imagery he puts on the screen. And I know whether with him or any other working Black actor or Black actor that's trying to work, there's roles presented that may not be the best look for Black people as a whole. They may be a good look for that actor, but they might not be a good look for the community. It makes me think of Hollywood Shuffle, where the critique I took away from that was, I, I love the way he framed it, like if, if you need work, then the post office is always hiring. Do you think that Black actors and Black creatives in general have a certain responsibility to be more critical of the roles they accept and the images they portray? So I think I want to take the word responsibility out of this um, for once and sort of answer it without saying that particular word. Because, of course, that's been an age-old discussion since our advent into film. When the great Hattie McDaniel, who people then critiqued in the 1930s, 1939s, when Gone with the Wind came out, for being Mammy, the maid in Gone with the Wind. And she said something famously akin to, you know, I'd rather be paid you know, such and such thousands of dollars to play a maid rather than be one. Well, now that's real talk, right? And I don't think we can dismiss all of the roles, particularly prior to the 60s, as one in which they just sold out. And that was the end of it, right? Because I don't see the great Burt Williams, for example, who became the highest paid entertainment entertainer on Broadway at one point who performed in blackface as a sellout. So there is, I think, always going to be this clamor and not, you know, unjustifiably. I mean, I think there's some justification for that because if you look at how we have been demeaned and and disempowered in terms of American cinema, of course it's going to come up. But we're not in the same place that we were 67 years ago and making choices in these narrow ways. So of course we have more opportunities, but it's still also some slim pickings for Black actresses, right? That's why you can't, you, you can't necessarily at one time in every period up to now name 10 Black actresses getting as many roles as, as Kate Blanchett and Kate Winslet. Am I right? So there's a lot of stakes, I think, still in terms of actresses and actors, Black actresses and actors trying to sustain a career to keep working, to build a career. Yeah, it's interesting because I hear that critique often. However, I don't necessarily hear that about your average person working a nine to five, like that may also be contributing to uh, the system of white supremacy in a certain way, right? So if it's like the critique is that these images contributed to that, but someone who works for the bank as a teller, it's a nine to five, but they're still doing something that enforces things that may harm us depending on what that bank's involved in. But that's understandable, isn't it? Because cinema is something that is a global industry that puts people in the public space and the public sphere that is consumed globally. And it is true that people have very distorted imagery of who African Americans are because what gets imported even in parts of Africa and to their country is so limited or may be so that that's what they think is African-American identity. They don't understand the, the diversity of it, of our many identities, because they're only getting these certain vehicles and nuggets imported. And heck, yes, it matters. For sure. It results in real world decisions and treatments. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So one trope that I've seen critique often recently is this idea of the white savior. Can you describe what this is for our audience? Oh, it's one of my favorites. One that annoys me a lot, right? That I've written about myself um, a number of times. So that's the character in the film, even if it's a supposedly Black film or a Black story, who ends up being really the hero, uh, who ends up, uh, you know, saving the day or being the character who is most noble or appears to be, at the end of the day, the most noble. He sort of outshined whoever the Black character is or, you know, the Black hero is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Can you give a couple well-known examples our audience may be familiar with? Oh, you want me to go there? Yeah, please. 
The Help. That's one of my favorites. And it's one of the films that left me livid when I left the movie theater. I was livid is Amistad because it really focuses so little on the, the voices and the story. And instead, I mean, you get more of Adams, you know, in his garden mooning over some African violin than you get. To, I mean, it's just it's just completely insane to me. And Green Book didn't set too well with me either. The dynamics of that being billed as the black guy story and it really not. And some of the representations of him, including his sexuality, were really horrible. And that it did fall into some of that white savior-esque trope. Mm. So who do you think benefits from these type of images? You know, film is a very psychological enterprise, isn't it? That's why there's so many articles and essays over time that, that study the psychology of cinema, right? Psychology all spills out on the screen. So I think there's some real psychological implications to how that feeds a certain level of white man's Burton-esque, you know, release there. I think that's been a part of liberal cinema. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, and we see these images repeated. There's this idea of repetition and propaganda. Are you able to speak a little bit to how the repetition of images may affect how black people see themselves to see their place in the world. Sure, that's why you get conditioned. That's why there are so many stories of people growing up, you know, and they're standing on that Oscar stage and what do they talk about? Growing up, right, not seeing images of themselves over and over again, even in the shows that they may have loved as children. They didn't see people who looked like them with complicated stories or with stories that were, you know, just normal human beings type of stories. So it has a great, as I said, psychological impact because if you don't see yourself represented all the time in a space where you live, like popular culture, particularly film, then that's going to have this sort of social and, you know, I think psychological implications and consequences. And it also means that collectively, people are not seeing other groups of folk as, quote, the norm. They measure themselves as the norm because they're being represented as the measure, right, and the norm. Do you think Hollywood has the best interests of Black people in mind when they make films? Well, it's a funny thing because when I'm sitting in class with students, often in a, a class called Film Criticism and Theory, when I hit the, have hit them historically sometimes with this ideal that, the, that this was conscious, that Hollywood was a conscious machine. In other words, decisions are made in rooms and offices at the highest level that are very conscious. It's not happenstance that a mammy ends up on the screen. It's not happenstance that you see dark-skinned uh, black males may be represented in characters associated with violence when there is a distinct belief that attaches criminality to black folk, in particular young black males, uh, youthful black males, particularly even of a, a type of skin color. That's not happenstance that you then see it represented on screen that way. Because I think it's really hard and horrific to think people intentionally sit in offices and make decisions that demean you, even if it's because privilege allows you. Well, what kind of excuse is that? Because my white privilege does allows me not to interrogate my choices. But we've seen plenty of folks who were really radical of all races go against the strain of their time and do just that, haven't we? What would it take for Black creators to create an empire of our own that actually had, was established with an interest of telling stories about our community in a way that we controlled to a degree that we don't control now within the Hollywood system? Well, see, I think that's happening, but understand it's not going to look the same as it did in the early 20th century. Because very many people are entering the space because you can now. We can make film on our computers and we can do it with our iPhones and people can get together and form their companies. So that's going to look differently. But you have people right now doing that. They understand the power of media. They understand that we have to be in ownership. We have to be producers of it, right? I mean, what do, what do we think the Charles Kings, the Will Packards, the Byron Allens are doing, if not that. And Oprah, hello. I mean, when she went off to do her own network and she was like, this is what I'm going to do. And right, it could stay comfortably. I think one of the thing is to demystify entertainment a little bit. I mean, 
I tell my son who's only 10, right? We have conversations when we go see things because I'm getting him introduced to the ideal that critical thinking and entertainment are not separate things. That we that we see things on TV, favorite shows, films that we want to go see. And we always have responses to them. So I think that we have to have more conversations like that that really illuminate something that's really basic in our thinking about that, that these go together, critical thinking, right, and watching for our pleasure. And that there's joy and pleasure in the critical thinking and talking about something that we spend 15 bucks to go see and that we know costs millions of dollars to make. Um, That's worth talking about and having real conversation about it. And we shouldn't be afraid to debate it and have, you know, be passionate about it. Yeah, I think people often forget, well, I don't even know if people are aware that storytelling as just the oldest form of passing down ideas and values to society is intended to serve a certain purpose. It doesn't just exist in a vacuum. But I think there's opportunity to tell stories that are more influenced by our experiences and our traditional approaches to storytelling in a way that I think may connect with Black audiences in a way that we haven't seen on a mass level before. Well, see, one of the things that has to happen is that we have to really mature our palette for films stylistically. Because that is, I think, one of the worst things that holds us back from embracing the fullness of the stories that are being told by Black filmmakers and other filmmakers of color. We're very attached to a a very really relatively narrow stylistic way of telling films so that things that are not get quickly sort of dismissed or or relegated to art house or avant-garde in such a way that in other countries they would not be that, right? I was very encouraged by seeing Parasite, you know, win Best Picture. But when we think about somebody like Barry Jenkins and the conversations I had with some people about you know, if Bill Street could talk and, you know, you know, that particular film. And I think that some of, you know, our folk, black folk were were somewhat bothered by, you know, the pacing and the fact that he really takes his time in terms of the silences, really plays with silence and, you know, darkness and light is a very artistic, lyrical sort of narrative, right? It is not what we quote are necessarily used to right seeing right now. Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. And so I think that is a real issue with us. I think that's the reason why something like Daughters of the Dust or way before that and Killer of Sheep, which are classics, but are in such a way sort of relegated, sort of contained in a sort of box of like, this is a certain level of artistic film, blah, 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 right? Rather than one of our standards, one right. of our stylistic choices. You see what I'm saying? We have to kind of grow our palette we got to be able to appreciate the artistry of film and really kind of, I think, be able to take it in and appreciate, you know, those things that are not typical that we see in film. Dr. Stephanie Dunn, thanks so much. This has been great. Go see more cinema, but always, you know, don't be afraid to, to, to think about it and, and talk about it in a, a real way. And just like that, we're at the end of this episode of Black History Year. Black History Year is produced by Push Black, the nation's largest nonprofit black media company. Production support from Michael L. Sesser and Lemina House. Obviously, the power that comes from knowing our history is important to you. Push Black exists because we saw we had to take this into our own hands. You make Push Black happen with your contributions at blackhistoryyear.com. Most folks do five or 10 bucks a month but everything truly makes a difference. Thanks for supporting the work. I'm Jay from Push Black. Thanks for checking us out. Peace.